Hello, welcome to Fandom Friday, a podcast focused on various fandoms brought to you by Fan Nation, the Geek Stravaganza, the Ocean County Library's annual all ages fandom library con. On today's episode, we'll be discussing Heartstopper. First, quick introductions. My name is Steven. I am a children's and teen librarian at the Upper Shores branch. Joining me today are... I'm Emily, and I am working out of the Public Relations Department of the Ocean County Library. And I'm Erin. I work at the Lakewood branch as a children's librarian. So today, like I said, we will be discussing the Heartstopper series. Uh, if you have only seen the TV show, have not read the books, uh, we will be covering some things that have not yet been covered in the TV show. So there is a mild spoiler warning. So proceed with caution for the rest of this podcast. So today we're, we have a list of some discussion questions that we came up with, and we're just going to have a chat about this really impactful series. So uh, first, before we get started, let's t- talk a little bit about what the Heartstopper series is about. So Heartstopper is a story about uh, some teens living in England. Um, one is Charlie. He's an openly gay teenager at an all-boys school. He meets and befriends a rugby player named Nick, who is a seemingly straight person, uh, and they build a friendship together, and over time, that friendship begins to blossom to a little bit more, and there is a whole other cast of other characters who are all you know, kind of figuring out their own identities and navigating their way through school. And it's just a really lovely, charming series that has really captured the hearts of many people. So with that, I think we'll just go into our first discussion question. And our first question is, one of the things that makes Heartstopper so popular is that fans feel a connection to the characters and the story. So what aspects for this group here, what aspects of Heartstopper did you feel that you could relate to? For me, it's definitely the characters. I think that's the heart of Heartstopper and you know you can relate to every single character they come from such diverse backgrounds and also their experiences it feels so real like you could know Charlie you could know a Nick you could know Tara Darcy they're people that we've met in life and I think that's what's so beautiful about the series both the books and the recent Netflix adaptation is just so refreshing to see people that we know that we either identify with or that we've met in our life be represented in such a beautiful story. Absolutely. I 100% agree with that. Erin, how about you? I think for me, when I look at those characters, I mean, granted, I'm, I'm, I'm very much adult at this point, but... <laughs> so <laughs> so our, I think all of us here are very much adults. <laughs> um, but when I think back, I feel like these were the people that I would have wanted to be friends with. If I knew them in high school, these would be the people I would probably have sought out to interact with, to share my time with. Absolutely. No, I felt the same way, like reading the books, especially seeing them like brought to life on Netflix. All I kept thinking was that, oh my gosh, like I wish, first of all, I wish these characters were real I wish they like actually I mean but in a way they do like like you said Emily like I feel like we all have known people like this they're Al- Alice Oseman the author and creator of this series um you know she really did such a wonderful job creating this world and these characters who feel so relatable and so realistic that you can say like I know I feel like I know these people I feel like they are real because they're so relatable on so many different levels so How about we go around and how about we all say either a character who is just our flat out favorite, we just like them for whatever reason, or the one that we relate the most to. Emily, do you want to go first? You know, I feel like I am the oddest combination of Nick and Darcy. I, you know, chaotic, chaotic, but also (laughs) like with Nick, there's kind of this like softer side and there's such a warmth about Nick and kind of just how he is as a character and his relationships with both with Charlie and with the friends. But then on the other hand, again, totally chaotic Darcy and just bouncing off the walls at random times. So, Mm -hmm. but yeah, definitely a combination of both. That's good. That's good. Erin, how about you? Gosh, I think in some ways a little bit of Charlie, because I think especially more in high school and sometimes even now I sort of have that self-doubt about, you know, I look around, I'm like, these are really cool people. Why do they like me? (laughs) But also, I think sort of in a way, a little bit of Isaac and just the, I'm so happy to be with these people and Mm -hmm. I'm just happy to kind of just be going around life. Isaac, I think Isaac might be my favorite. 
Isaac Isaac is just a precious oh, Isaac is just a precious <laughs> cinnamon roll of a person. And also like not for nothing, but I think us being, you know, in the library profession, I think he's always reading a book. I think we can all you know, relate to that. And even yes. just like, even so much in the, in the Netflix series where you can really see like what he's reading, yeah. you know, the we recognize greatest, a lot of books. The greatest reading list of all time. I, oh, it's I, unbelievable. I've copied a few of them myself because I'll, I'll look, you know, like when I'm rewatching the show and I'll just kind of, it's fun to look over and see what Isaac is reading. I'll be like, ah, oh, all right. I, I, I got to add that to my list. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> exactly. No, I 100% agree with that. For me, I'm going to say, well, my favorite character is Nick for me- for many different reasons. For me, like, I just think that, you know, I just said that Isaac's a precious cinnamon roll, but that's just like, that's always what I've called Nick. Like, that's always been like my, <laughs> my like way to describe him because he's just such a sweet gentle soul like and I just love like kind of like the rough like rugby player type of like stereotype that he like kind of has at the very beginning but like right away you realize that he's really just like a very just like soft-hearted like kind person and just a lot of the times like when I I, I've read the book series like quite a few times I've seen the um, Netflix series a, a few times as well and every time I every time I've either you know read it or viewed it I I always just think there's so many different attributes about Nick that for myself at least but like I feel like anyone like just there's some qual- qualities about him that I feel like we all could like learn lessons from just like how to like treat other people mm-hmm. and you know the way that he sticks up for Charlie not just Charlie but for everyone but like especially Charlie um he's just a very like good person and just just such a sweet and just especially in the first book like when he's really grappling with you know the issue well the first and second book I mean really the whole series but like you know especially (laughs) especially the first and second book when he's really grappling with his identity his uh you know sexual identity and everything like that like you know I definitely could feel for him in a lot of those ways as well I also think especially as okay so here's where we get into like mild spoilers this is for people who have only seen the tv show we have not gotten to this part yet uh but for Charlie I felt that I related to him uh, in a lot of ways because of his mental health struggles. So we start to see a little bit of this um, in the third book when they go on the Paris trip. We start to see like little glimpses of this. He starts to like divulge some of the hardships that he's had, the hardships that he's had in his past, but he's still kind of like currently reckoning with. And then the fourth book is kind of where everything kind of comes to a head. We really um, kind of see the depths of his mental health struggles and as someone who myself has gone through many you know different mental health struggles I I I kind of discovered these books at like a very at a specific time of my life where I was really struggling mentally and to have a character who and you know especially in YA books finding seeing characters who struggle with mental health is kind of something that you do see a lot because it is something that is featured in a lot of YA books I feel like teenagers definitely experience a lot of issues with this but to see Alice create a character that was so fleshed out and just really portrayed it in such a realistic way with like a glimmer of hope at the end that it's not just you know being someone with chronic mental illness you know for lack of a better term you to be able to have like a glimmer of hope at the end and you know not just all like doom and gloom like that really was refreshing it really helped me through a lot so I definitely would say that I I I certainly admire I admire all the characters but I admire different attributes of both Nick and Charlie but I find you know a lot that I can relate to with them as well it's done so beautifully Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what you point out so well is just how these characters are fleshed out and how that progression of seeing how Charlie is struggling, kind of the glimpses that we do get in the third volume and how that eventually plays out. It's it's very much like life. And you're right, it's not all doom and gloom, but it's not trying to be something it's not. It's very much kind of this like wonderful mosaic Mm -hmm. of... Mm. An experience in of these characters. Right. Absolutely. And there's a, a really powerful scene that the, the, this is just full on spoiler, just because, <laughs> just because you know, <laughs> it's important, but it's important to this conversation. So this is in the fourth book. Uh, so there's a scene, uh, Nick's on holiday um, with his mob. And there's a scene on the beach where, you know, it's, he's kind of become like very aware 
of the struggles that Charlie's dealing with. He's dealing with a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, and also struggling with an eating disorder as well, which, you know, for those who are fans of the TV show, uh, we'll start to get a little bit into that in the third season. The third season's going to be at the Paris trip. I, you know, did some digging. Oh, I, I was hope. able to, I, <laughs> yes, I did some digging and it was confirmed that that is like what's coming next. So I'm like, yes. oh, thank God. Okay. Um, <laughs> but in the fourth, so, uh, so we start to see a little bit of that and then kind of book four is where, like, like I said before, like all this mental, you know, the anxiety, the eating, everything kind of like comes to a head and kind of, you know, he, I wouldn't say he hits rock bottom, but he definitely has like a lot of like moments of like severe vulnerability i'll just say Mm. that but you know nick who we kind of come to realize like just hasn't really had much experience with at least not the kind of experience that he was able to like kind of pinpoint we kind of as the book goes on we kind of see that he himself like naturally kind of struggles with issues as well and kind of that's that's the point is that it's kind of like everyone struggles with some of these issues some people have it worse than others um but that's kind of like the lesson to be learned is that this is something that's just very common and that people do deal with but you know there's this really powerful scene where he just is so worried and so scared and he doesn't know what to do and his mom you know is there to comfort him and he's just like you know i'm his boyfriend i i i need to do something for him like i need to help him and you know, she's there to be like you know it's not it's not that easy just because you love someone doesn't mean you can fix them that's you all you can do is be there for them but like he needs like actual help and luckily he does seek out actual professional help and then you know we do see that like I said there is a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel like you know he definitely does get out of that really kind of like downward spiral so things you know definitely do look up like you know some some people get very like scared when it comes to the fourth book because it's definitely the most like serious of of Mm -hmm. the series but like don't Mm -hmm. worry it bounces and right now volume five is being you know kind of published online in the webtoon so like it's already kind of started and like already we're kind of like in a different different world now it's dealing with different issues but not quite as serious so like some people get very bummed out for the when the fourth book it's personally my favorite it's the most well written of of all of them I would say but you know for those who maybe are casual viewers who want to get into the books like don't don't be discouraged it's all lovely it all works out yeah don't don't worry <laughs> um But yeah, so, so that's kind of, you know, that's really what I, that's why it means so much to me. Like, I love the characters and I love the story and it's just so sweet and precious, but just like the way that Alice is able to like really accurately portray these struggles that not just teens, but people of all ages go through is just so remarkable. And it's just such a special series. Right. And I was going to say too, like, like Aaron had mentioned in the beginning, we're, we're a little bit older. I'm not gonna lie. Like mm-hmm. we're, we're 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 adults, and <laughs> we're library that's... library people of a certain age. <laughs> let's just say. Exactly. <laughs> but, I'm, I'm I'm 40. I'm proud to say I don't care. I'm 30. I I will say that as well. <laughs> I, I'm I'm on the younger end. I, I'm still in my early 20s, but, oh, but I lucky think you. that's I think <laughs> oh, I think that's. <laughs> I think that's the beauty of the series and of the show is that I've seen people of all ages just yeah. go wild over it and and for the right reasons just being so excited to see something that they can connect to and I think that's kind of the power of storytelling not to get on not to be a little corny but I I think it's just one of those series like it's something special and I think it's so evident when you watch reactions when you Mm-hmm. you know talk to someone who's read the books or seen the show it's just something that everyone either is so happy to have experienced and also it's something that like I wish I had this when I was a teenager you Bingo. Uh, like yes it, it's such it's such a powerful series and especially in like the scenes that we were talking about um Stephen in volume four I think again it's just done so well and in such a way that what a great way to broach that topic and to understand, you know, this is some, something, mental illness is something that teenagers are dealing with and at any age you can deal with. And if you're someone who hasn't had those experiences or, you know, have someone in your life that you don't know how to broach that topic and don't know how to deal with, what a great way to understand that and become comfortable and start having those conversations in your life and right. a way just to help normalize seeking help and that it is okay because in past times seeking mental health help or assistance or anything was seen as you know if you're seeking help then there's something obviously very there's and it was a 
a taboo subject and you didn't talk about it. And that the more we pushed it under the rug, the worse it was for people. So the more we can no normalize seeking help for any, you know, depression, eating disorders, whatever to understand. And sometimes it is just, uh, you know, sometimes it's something that needs to be helped with medication. Sometimes it's not for people to understand that it is okay to seek help and it's normal. There's nothing wrong with getting help. Absolutely. And I feel like, right. And I feel like what this also shows, like what Heartstopper shows, how far we've come, but also yeah. how far we have to go. And mm -hmm. I, the thing that makes me so excited is I can't wait to see more stories like this. And I feel like it's just the beginning. Absolutely. And you're at a point where like, oh, this is like, this is something I wish I, I had when I was a teenager. And it's like, I cannot wait to see what they come out with. It's so, it's just showing what representation does and what just a true human story can, like the impact that it can have on not just teenagers, but everybody. Right, exactly. And that, you you know, you really hit it right on the head there. Like, and, and that's kind of like, I, I've certainly said it myself, like, you know, mostly to myself, but also like out loud before, <laughs> like, this is like, this is the series that I wish that I had had when I was younger. And not to say they didn't exist, but it was never quite as prevalent as this, like, you know, right. Like, yes, there were LGBT books. Yes, there were books about mental health. But like, you know, for, first of all, you're hard pressed to find one that dealt with like both of them because, and this is kind of, you know, I've seen a lot of like the cast, like for the Netflix series, like in interviews and stuff like that. They've also kind of said the same thing. Like representation is like a huge piece. It's a huge, like important factor about the series. And that's like what people feel most connected to. They find some sort of representation in it, whether it's representation in the LGBT community, whether it's mental health representation, whether it's just any other type of re representation. Like there are people of all different like ethnic backgrounds and races, like, you know, there's kind of a little bit of everything in, the, in there. Some some cast members, like in interviews, have mentioned this, that a lot of times in previous times, a lot of LGBT stories kind of were told from a place of like a tragedy, almost like it's always just kind of portrayed as just like a tragedy. It's like, oh, look how hard this life is for this person. And not to say that's not true in some cases, it, it can be very difficult to be a member of the community. But, you know, the thing about Heartstopper is that like, yes, it's not without those things. Like there definitely is like, you know, they do touch on like, you know, discrimination and bullying a little bit, but that's not the focal point. The focal point is this love story between these two mm -hmm. people. And, you know, there's a lot, there's some quote drama with like, you know, the whole like, you know, figuring out your identity. And, you know, like I said, there is like a little bit of like a bullying aspect, but at the end of the day, the focal point, it's just a love story. It's people, it's queer people like having a love story that pans out that doesn't just end in some sort of heartbreak or you know ends with like it's just a very cute precious love story so so that's like another thing that's also great is that like it kind of breaks that mold of you know lgbt literature that a lot of times did kind of have this like stereotype just like oh another depressing story about a queer person but this is like okay here's one that's actually like look a queer person living like a happy life like you know and this hopefully is definitely the trend that we're going and hopefully more stories that are told like this are told kind of from the same lens of like you know you can be queer and happy like you know <laughs> you can you can have it all you can even live with mental health and still live a happy life it's and that's always struck me as well that just like you know it's very true like it's you don't normally see stories like this so it's good that they're finally being told like this all right shall we move on to our next question perhaps sure. okay i'm ready <laughs> all right so our next question was so the next question was did you find the books or the show first uh for me i'll say that i found the books first um so being a children's and teen librarian i read a lot of you know middle grade i read a lot of ya books uh for my job just kind of like keep track i love graphic novels i always have because i was I used to be like a really like strong reader. And then I kind of like when I was a teenager, kind of like became a little more reluctant. I just kind of like fell away from books a little bit. And then when I was starting to get interested again, I you know, started working for libraries. I found that graphic novels were a really great re-entry point into reading because, you know, they're fast paced. Usually they're fast paced. Like the illustrations are beautiful. Like the stories are just compelling. Uh, so I just was, and the good thing about graphic novels is that you can kind of, usually you can, you know, plow through them pretty quickly. So, you know, for me, like I was able to kind of just like, you know, I could read a graphic novel like in an hour and then be like, okay, what next? So I kind of just like looking around. I also really love 
LGBT literature. So like, I was kind of just like researching. I think it was just like Googling, just like, you know, looking for different things. I think I'd read, I forget, like I've read like a, a lot of other like similar books as well. I think I guess I kind of just like look in like, oh, what's similar? And uh, this series came out, Heart Stopper. I'm like, okay, I'll read it. And I read, I think, I read the first I read the first volume and then I read the first three volumes because at that point volume four hadn't been published yet in like book form it was still just online the webtoon so I read the first three books like absolutely loved it like fell in love with it then discovered that book four was you know for free online in the webtoon and then that was kind of like what solidified it for me because that one like I mentioned before is just very special to me because of all the mental health stuff and that was kind of like that whole culmination was just like oh my God, like, you know, that's kind of like how I just fell into this, you know, spiral of just like <laughs> loving, <laughs> like loving the book, a good spiral, not a bad spiral um, of just like this world and loving this book and then, you know, devouring all of her other books. So um, anyone else who did you discover the books first, the series first? I found the series first. I was just, you know, hanging out one day, going through Netflix. I'm like, Heartstopper. Okay. I'm like, well, let's see. And <laughs> <laughs> binge that I've watched the whole thing that one day I'm like <laughs> I think I watched it again the next day which is just that's kind of my personality is if I mm-hmm. find something um that I enjoy I will watch it many times <laughs> no absolutely and I know a lot of people I know most people I know found the series first uh, the Netflix series which you know makes a lot of sense and then you know hope I my hope is that I've to people I've known who have like just casually mentioned like oh I watched this Heartstopper series so cute I'm just like read the books like go get the books read them <laughs> like they're so good um but yeah no a lot of people I find do it and it's very bingeable like I also like oh absolutely yeah I also watch the whole thing one day because for those of you who are interested in checking out the series it is on Netflix it's only eight the first season's only eight episodes uh each one's like you know 20 to 30 minutes long Like it really moves very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's very easy to get through like one sitting and then it's very easy to just like watch again and again. It gives people like a boost of serotonin. It really does. Like it's just kind of like, you know, when you just need to pick me up and feel good. That's how I was with the books. Like if I ever was feeling down, the books always kind of like perk me up. It's the same thing with the series. They both, you know, from my experience, have the same effect. Oh, absolutely. I found the the show first and... I'd been seeing, I'm a big bookstagrammer for people don't, that don't know. That is mm-hmm. the book side of Instagram. I love that <laughs> place to be. And as the show was getting ready to release, I, you know, I'd seen a teaser very casually. I saw a lot of like, oh, Heartstopper. Oh, I can't wait to, you know, Nick and Charlie. And, you know, my reading list is long. So I, you know, I was like, okay, like maybe I'll put it on my watch list. And I saw it. I, and I watched the first episode. I was like, all right, like, it's going to be really casual, cute. As soon as the first episode ended, I was like, okay, we are in. I, I binged the whole thing in one day. And then I was like, oh, I have to read the books. And kind of like what you said, Stephen, reading the books for me, it felt like watching the series all over again. And then watching the series brought me back to the books. And I think even though those episodes are so, to me are so short, I feel like they kind of mirror each other in a lot of ways like the same way that I binge the series is how I read the books and it keeps me on a cycle I keep re-watching I keep rereading and now I'm along for the ride I am in I know I I totally that's 100% there with you no absolutely all right let's let's move on to our next question I feel like because I feel like this kind of relates a little bit to this like talking about both the series, like the book series and the TV series. The Netflix series objectively is a fairly accurate page to screen adaptation, but like most adaptations, there are a few differences between the books and the show. So what were some of your thoughts on these changes? Well, first, maybe we can discuss a little bit about what some of these changes were. I think we mentioned this before, but the TV series covers the first two volumes. So it covers like, you know, from the very beginning to the time when Nick and Charlie like officially you know, declare that they're boyfriends and that when, you know, Nick has that Nick has that really sweet coming out scene with his mom, which, you know, both in the book and the TV show, just like, you know, which like Olivia Coleman. Olivia yes. Coleman. Olivia, Olivia Coleman, Coleman, who was a surprise. They kept that they kept oh, that a surprise. Wonderful surprise that, she, that, that she was 
they had said i it was funny because alice had like announced like you know because you know she does a lot of like q a's with like on twitter and stuff like that and someone had asked like about like oh like who's gonna be playing nick's mom and she was like well like i'm not like i'm not gonna say it's a surprise but like it's a like oscar winning english actress i think a lot of people are like okay probably olivia coleman but it's, even then like even when people kind of like deduced that uh, oh it's probably her people still lost their minds like when it was her and she was so good a, I mean of course a plus. She I mean the casting overall was just so Amazing. so great but like uh, Olivia Coleman as Nick's mom I, I mean she crushed that role and she did I, I, everybody did but like Olivia Coleman so so good there are a couple changes off the top of my head the first thing was Ben's character uh, definitely was given a little more in the series I don't know how I feel about this so for for those who don't who have not you know watched either or read or read the books or so Ben at the beginning of the story is kind of Charlie's kind of boyfriend but not at all he's basically just using him he is all Ben's also like uh, figuring out his sexuality but in like a not so nice way like really stringing stringing Charlie along who's openly gay like it's kind of like already figured himself out and he's just not a nice person and you know he's just not not overall a great person in the book he doesn't really get much like after that he kind of just like disappears and everyone's like okay good riddance bye but in <laughs> in the tv series they try I don't know if they're trying to like prep him for like a redemption arc I don't think so but they give him a little bit more to do and there's also for me what I didn't like is that they made him part of like Nick's friend group and so like even after like Nick like tells him off it's like you know like in the books he kind of disappears at that but in the show he's still kind of like around and like still just like being like terrible to Charlie and I'm just kind of like I don't know. I wish they had just kind of like let him go away because he already because Charlie already has to deal with Harry the the oh, bully. Harry. Uh, Harry. <laughs> like on top of that, I was like, you also have to deal with like your like former like abuser for like lack of any better term than like kind of what he was like. Like I don't know. I kind of just like I was like, give give this poor kid a break. Like you really need to like you know keep br- bringing this character in. So I don't know. There's still plenty more series to go. It's re- it's renewed for at least two more seasons now, which is amazing. So there's plenty of time to kind of yeah. see where this goes. But what are anyone else's thoughts on Ben as a character and especially like kind of his portrayal in the series because that's like the one thing that I, if I could like make one change I would probably have less of him but maybe maybe you guys have a different perspective I mean he does play a bit of a part in solitary as well which is one of that's her true books. yes um he does come into play there too but I think they kind of wanted to the the, the people that were added or changed for the most part I think were added to add drama and he did add the, you know he added drama and to the point in the um in episode seven where you almost think that he's going to beat charlie up in the parking lot because he noticed him holding hands with nick to that point he gets to be a kind of a scary character and i think they i for that i think they probably would like hey drama plus maybe they liked you know the 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 actor and wanted to well that's true and i will say that he is sebastian croft who plays who plays Ben, is a great actor like he's definitely like (laughs) human like i and i feel like that's always the funniest thing to see is when the people you're like like the, the ones that rile you up and that are the most disliked in movies and shows i feel like are the sweetest people in real life <laughs> i know i know and that's and that's like apparently you know i obviously i've obviously never met him but he seems like a, <laughs> he seems like a perfectly lovely person in real life so that's always like refreshing the other so one of the other changes they add so someone mentioned they added a few characters they did add a few characters for um for the tv series so isaac was actually an addition he's he's sort of in the book so in the books it's portrayed by the character alid who is actually in a spinoff book, uh, Radio Silence, which if you haven't read is excellent, I highly recommend. But then, you know, they decided to turn him into Isaac, who like shares some similar like attributes. But the one of uh, the character that was like completely brand new was Imogen, mm-hmm. who I thought that was a very, I thought that was a good addition because she was kind of like added to be kind of like the foil to Charlie a little bit because like, you know, Nick's pursuing this pseudo kind of, you know, budding relationship with Charlie and then at the same time like this girl who very clearly likes him 
uh, who wants to date him and he's kind of struggling between, you know, you know, and then it kind of comes out as like, oh, he's bisexual. So, you know, it kind of, you know, it kind of is a good setup for that whole story arc. So I do think that she's a good, she's kind of annoying, like the character, but, <laughs> but in terms of the story, she does add like a, a very interesting element to it. So I think that her presence is definitely, you know, adds another layer to it that's appreciated. I don't know, anyone's thoughts on Imogen? Besides the fact that she's annoying, because I oh, you'd be hard pressed, pre- <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that says that she's not. But <laughs> oh, okay. So listen, I was. Oh my on... god, are you an Imogen apologist? Okay, not that far. <laughs> but I, the first couple episodes, like I, at first I was like, yeah, along with everyone else, I was like, oh, she's so annoying. How does she uh... not realize what she's doing? And then. I kind of step back a little bit and especially when you get that really great scene of Nick and Imogen in the park and for me that was not like a redemption but you kind of see their teenagers and right there I think it was a really special moment of just rather than getting you know like the quote-unquote other love interest who is like the usual teenage drama trying to plot against the other person or just ends up being problematic I feel like it was a really nice way to just be like two teenagers just saying hey like this is kind of the point in my life that I'm at kind of also you get Nick kind of hinting at his like sexuality and I feel like it was a really lovely moment of just yeah like we're we're teenagers like we have crushes we are trying to figure out our lives and it was just a really beautiful moment for that character. And I feel like I, especially with Imogen and then with Ben, I think the heart of the story is Nick and Charlie, in my opinion. And I feel like those characters were really used to kind of bolster that and add more depth with Ben. I, I am with you. I am not a fan of Ben by any means, Mm -hmm. but I think the point of his added scenes and added material was just kind of showing the difference between struggling with your sexuality I think we see the journey that Nick goes through and kind of him saying to Charlie like hey like I I have feelings for you but I'm still figuring things out I can you be patient and not really even asking that of him just kind of that mutual understanding of this is a struggle for this character and for this person and realizing kind of those difficulties and those feelings and trying to figure out who you are and then having Ben be this person who's having those same struggles but is toxic for lack of a better word yeah and not having that kind of showing that foil between him and Nick and kind of the differences in their behaviors and again like I think just exemplifying like those struggles and people like Ben do exist are they it, it, was his character pleasant no but those people do exist and seeing how nick and charlie and everybody reacts to those situations it, again i think it just adds that depth of realism of these are the struggles that teenagers are facing there's people like ben but there's also people like nick and people like charlie and unfortunately people like harry and i i think again like it just kind of drives the series of how realistic it is right and I definitely agree like you know the one positive to giving Ben more screen time in the tv series is that you can see and they you know set it up pretty well on several occasions where you can kind of and people have brought this argument like I've seen people like online like kind of bring this argument up where like you know they both kind of do similar things in like keeping the relationship with Charlie a secret but it's for like different reasons because Ben is Ben we don't really know 100% because we don't really know much about his journey and his own like struggles or whatever but like the seemingly on the surface it's like okay Ben's hiding his relationship with Charlie because he's ashamed for whatever reason whereas Nick is hiding it just because he's still figuring things out he's still unsure about things but it's not necessarily he's not necessarily ashamed so it does kind of like present like interesting parallels where they've even like you know, have said some of similar things, but it's like the either the way that's been said or like, you know, just like, it is interesting to see that parallel. So that's right. one, one of the few positives to having Ben be a little right. more fleshed out. It does like provide that opportunity for storytelling. It's basically saying those struggles are valid and struggling with your sexuality, but 
it's no excuse to be toxic to the person you're with or the person you have feelings for. And I think it was very clearly drawing that line by having, again, similar experiences with those two characters and similar struggles, but totally different outcomes and actions. Absolutely. 100%. Aaron, any any additional thoughts? I, I just, I strangely, I just had this thought, like, well, we don't know what Ben is going through. I just had a moment of like sympathy for Ben. Like, how do we know that his his parents are not like uptight or very, you know, straightforward? And he he knows that if he acknowledges these feelings in real life, he's. I still dislike him a lot, but I, you know, maybe they, then that might be something that gets explored if they if they continue him acknowledges that his home life is terrible and he reaches out. I just Absolutely. gave him. A, I just gave him a redemption arc. Well, yeah. I mean, like, you're you're right, though. Like, you know, we can try to give him a little bit of benefit. Doubt. It doesn't excuse, like, any of no. the things that he has done because the things he had done, like, objectively are pretty bad. But, <laughs> you know, I would be... And it's kind of... If we can kind of go into... This kind of, like, leads into, like, our next question where we can, we can kind of, like, keep talking about this specific point. Uh, because, like I mentioned before, Netflix has already renewed the series for two more seasons. So there's going to be at least through season three, hopefully more... But we are going to get at least three seasons, which is amazing. Um, And so what are we most looking forward to in the coming season? So this is one thing that might be explored. I don't know if it's necessarily something we're necessarily looking forward to, but it's something that I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to flesh it out. If nothing Mm -hmm. else, because I'm sure they want to keep the actor Sebastian on, which I'm totally in support of, because like I said, even though the character is a little like dicey, he's very good in it. And I would love for him to, you know, continue to be a part of the series. And I would be curious to see if like, not to see him get, you know, the redemption arc, but at least to kind of like dive a little bit deeper into the character. Like, like you said, like, explore his home life like does he have like extremely homophobic parents like you know is he dealing with abuse at home or something like that like it would be interesting to at least see some sort of justification or not even a justification just see the the why the why behind the action so that's one thing that I would be curious to see if they kind of dive into that a little bit more other than that um like I said the next season is going to be the Paris trip so for those who have read Mm -hmm. volume three Uh, know the books they take a field trip to Paris a school trip and this is where it's going to get interesting because one of the big plot minor spoiler um, one of the big like focal points of of this like part of the series is so in the tv series by the end of the first season Tao knows that Nick and Charlie are dating because he in the books like they took a while to tell him he was like the last one they told for like Tao Oh, oh, Tao. Like, he's, like, one of the last ones that they tell for, like, various reasons. Um, And that was kind of, like, the, quote, like, drama of, like, book three. Well, one of the drama pieces was that, like, you know, he finds out eventually and, like, at first, like, is offended that he took so long to be told. But then, you know, everything works out. It's all fine. Uh, But since he already knows by the end of the first season... I, I'm like, I'm curious, like, what else? Because, like, there's some, like, other things that happen on the Paris trip, but, mm-hmm. like, that was kind of, like, the main dramatic focal point. So, like, I'm curious to see, like, how... Because, like, it's very clear there's going to be some more, like, changes to the story. I'm just curious to see, you know, what what is going to come from that. But other than that, does anyone else have any, like, things, like, maybe specifically from the books that they're excited for, or some, like, wishes of, like, new plot lines they might, like, come up with? I'll be the first to admit, Volume 3 is my favorite. I, volume 3 is a lot of people's favorite. Just, I love Volume 3. It's such, I feel like it encapsulates what Heartstopper is. It's just such a joy. And kind of that atmospheric vibrance. I, I can't wait to see what they do with the sets, with the costumes, and just also, I'm just so excited to see this group of characters in Paris and see how that translates over in the Netflix series, because reading that was just so much fun. And it, it really it just, was. It jumped off the pages, and I was like, oh, I want to go to Paris with friends. I this know. sounds lovely. It just... So I can't wait to see what they do with that in season three. And I hope, well, not I hope, I, I know that they're going to do it justice because also I just want to take this time to say, Alice Oseman, thank you for thank what you, you have done, not only for the books, but just the hand that 
Alice Osman has had in the series. They have writing credits for the entire series uh, so far and has played such a significant role in the creative process. And it's so evident throughout the show as well, you know, the leaves and just, again, the lighting and the different set pieces like in the, art, the poster the artwork the right the artwork especially mm-hmm. in you know like the different rooms charlie's room specifically i feel like is a carbon copy um, of the book it, it is a carbon copy like if you put those two like right next to each other like it is a carbon copy and that is and that and that's like the importance of having the creator and the author like involved in the creative process in the tv show and i feel like that's a lot of the reason why you know book to screen adaptations aren't always wonderful because a lot of times the author isn't necessarily involved in the creative process for various reasons whether it's that they were invited to or they didn't want to but, you know, thank God that Alice was very heavily involved in this because that's how he got such a faithful adaptation. And even the changes that were made to it were not, nothing felt fully unnecessary. It felt like just a way to enhance the story. So like, right. it was it was great. And still, these are, you know, from, from Alice's world, from her mind. Like, it's not just like, you know, necessarily TV executives just like throwing in useless stuff for whatever reason. So... So absolutely, I, I'm very hopeful for amazing few more seasons. Aaron, how about you? Any anything specifically you're looking forward to with the I'm, upcoming seasons? I'm kind. Of, I'm looking forward to Ellen Tao and them exploring Paris mm-hmm. together. Yes, because that was a very fun thing. I'm also a little more on the drama end. I'm curious if they're if because it seems like they took out the little brother. They took out Oliver. But yes, they did take out Oliver, yeah. I don't think they will take out Nick's. I'm curious to see how uh, Nick's David. interaction between Nick's brother and then eventually his father. Yes. Because his brother is another very, very toxic person who comes into play. And like, it's interesting, it's something to see between how two siblings being raised by the same people can become so, so much different people and different like raised with the same, you know, love and care and whatever, then to become Nick and then to become David, da- I think. David, yep. Um, yeah, the fact that Olivia Coleman could create two different people. <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> so yes, I, I completely, I actually completely forgot about David. It's like he, yeah, he'll, it, it hasn't been announced like one way or the other. They haven't really, because obviously like it was just recently announced within the past like couple months. So like it's still very early developments. Um mm-hmm. But I would assume that he, I mean, I hope, it's another one of those things where it's like, I want him to be part of it because I want to explore that like side of the story, especially because he does come into play like a little bit more, but like, I'm not necessarily looking forward to it because he's a terrible person. Um, but I would also kind of in the same vein of Ben where like, you know, I still do kind of want to, like, I kind of would like to see, like, like you were saying, Aaron, like, you know, it's interesting how like, you know, they had you assume like very similar upbringings with like similar parents and like, you know, Nick's mom is just a very objectively like warm, loving, sweet per- like person. Like how could you have like a Nick who's just like, you know, our precious cinnamon roll and then, you know, David, who's just like a rotten, like old cinnamon roll. Like, you know, just like, <laughs> just a very toxic, <laughs> just a very toxic person. Like I would be kind of curious to see like if they, if, if he is going to be a character in the series, which I'm, I'm going to guess yes, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I would be curious to kind of see if we dive a little bit more into him and his like, you know, what he, what his deal is, like whether it's from his childhood or just kind of like the way he is now, like, He's a very interesting character, and um, I would be curious to see how they broach that in the TV show. Yeah, and I feel like in season one, we really did have a lot of, even though we had the lovely Olivia Coleman, I feel like it was much more focused on Charlie's home life. Like, when we did get those glimpses, it was a lot of Tori and a lot of Charlie's dad. And I feel like for me, like kind of looking at it creatively, I feel like the natural progression would be, okay, well, we have, we've established this home life for Charlie. Bringing in David, let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into Nick's home life. I I mean, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that was the main quote unquote drama Mm -hmm. of the next season is, you know, Nick's brother and especially since we are going to Paris which sidebar I am so excited to see Nick speak French 
And I just know. That whole, that whole I know. lovely moment. That lovely moment in, in the graphic novel. I We are also probably going to get Nick's dad. That's yeah. kind of a, a, another focal point of the Paris trip again. Yeah. We've said it so many times in this podcast, but spoiler warning. (laughs) (laughs) But um, yeah, just seeing, I I really wouldn't be surprised if that was like one of the major plot points is Nick's brother, but also Nick's dad. I mean, we have Olivia Coleman, who they could possibly cast as Nick's dad. I am. I know. I'm trying to think of other English Oscar winners. Like. Or, or, or French. French. Oh, French. He's he's duh. He's French, so it could be. I I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'll think. I'm sure we'll wrap up here, and I'll be like, ah, this person. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, Nick's dad is is very much like a focal point of book three. So that'll be another like piece that I'm sure. Like you know, now that we don't have the whole like you know Tao being like, oh, you didn't tell me that. Now that kind of was like wrapped up in the first season. We don't really have that. But you said before, you know, you're the summit. Summit. I forget who was like looking forward to like Tao. Like their relationship blossoming, and I wouldn't be surprised if they become like a much bigger focal point. Of and I wouldn't be surprised if it almost became like a Bridgerton type. As I don't know if anyone here watches Bridgerton, but like mm-hmm. how each series is, uh, each uh, season is kind of like revolves like around a different member of the family. Like I wouldn't be surprised if they did it like that way, kind of. Or I think it'd be interesting if they did it that way, where like you know, obviously like Nick and Charlie are still like the the focal points but like we see like a lot more of like this budding relationship because now that like charlie and nick's like relationship is pretty much fully established at this point like you know now all eyes are kind of like on tau and l who like were kind of left on the cliffhanger in the first season where it's like oh you're gonna get together oh they didn't but like you know obviously it's probably gonna happen so mm-hmm. so yeah i'd be i'd be excited to to dig into that as well i think we have time for one more question do we want to just go over one more question quickly and then and then we can start to wrap up sure let's do it just i think just as a, a note that how well they addressed so if you know usually you have a gay character or a lesbian character but you have a gay character a lesbian character a trans character and a especially from a lot of the review or the reactions that I've watched a bisexual character that does not get a lot of play usually they're very much pushed to the side or saying you know oh you're not you you just can't make up your mind kind of thing so that's something that was a good that was I saw in all the reactions that I watched because I watch a lot of reactions Mm. (laughs) and the validation because I feel yeah. like that's a, that's a kind of a, a huge and trope, a stereotype in media is the invalidation of yeah. bisexual characters, and I feel like that's <laughs> right. The indecisive was a shining, and I, yeah, and it was such a shining moment of the show of just yeah, yeah, like bisexual people exist. It, it's a valid sexuality, and what Stephen, what we all touched on in the beginning, it's just two people, a gay teenager and a bisexual teenager, having this wonderful relationship in their experiences, and I feel like it's such a validating thing, and yeah, Aaron, I absolutely love watching reactions to the show, because it's just such a happy thing to see someone be like, hey, that's someone like me, or that's someone that I can identify with, and there's so many like happy reactions and also the emotional ones are just they get me yeah. they I do think, yeah i think they might also because they re- replaced Aled with isaac basically and alice had said that she did that partially because Aled's story has been told in radio silence and isaac is just a, a, a ball of clay that they can mold however and you know he could be ace or pan and that might be something that will also get explored in the coming seasons right i know that uh, i know that alice has kind of like alluded that before they had announced that like the show was officially renewed for more seasons like she had said like her hope was that like for the next season i have big like asexual plans like <laughs> if if we're, so like it could be it could be anyone there's still some characters who we haven't really like you know touched mm-hmm. on with that could be isaac could be tori could be whoever else they introduce so i'll be very so it sounds like it's brewing it sounds like it's on the horizon so there's going to be even more thank god there's gonna be even more representation to cops that's really exciting okay so this kind of and that's kind of like we talked you mentioned we mentioned solitaire and radio silence so this kind of like brings 
brings us into our final question here. So we all know the Heartstopper is mostly Charlie and Nick stories, but Alice Oseman has written other novels that live in the same world that Charlie and Nick exist in. Has anyone here read any of the other books? Yes, I listened to Solid. I, basically, once I found out there were other ones, mm-hmm. and I found that we had them available through our streaming services. Mm-hmm. Um, I listened to Solitaire. I did Radio Silence. Did you read Loveless? Loveless, that was the other one. I've read all the other ones. Uh, <laughs> for those who don't know, Solitaire was her first book, and that's kind of where these characters came. So Nick and Charlie were, so Solitaire is Tori. So Tori is Charlie's older sister. Solitaire is her story. She's like the main character of that story. And then Nick and Charlie are just kind of like side characters that like yeah. pop in every once in a while. And then Heartstopper was kind of their spinoff where it kind of talked about their their backstory a little bit. And then, and then that's kind of what, that's what she became like, best known for was Heartstopper. That's kind of what gained her the most attention. But then she wrote, also wrote Radio Silence, which is an excellent book. All of her books are great. There really are none of her yeah. books that I dislike, but Radio Silence is really, really excellent. It, it, ta- it tells Alan's story, uh, talks about him running a podcast. There's another character, Francis, who is introduced that she's also really interesting. Loveless is great. I just finished it not too long ago. That If anyone's looking for a book about asexual representation, uh, asexual and aromantic, that is an excellent book. Um, there's talk about representation. That's mm-hmm. there's a you know branch of LGBT community that does not get discussed nearly enough. So, mm-hmm. and there's a whole book about it that's well written. And you know, hopefully, the hope is that we're going to get even more of that in Heartstopper as it goes. Uh, she also has another great book that I read. I was bored for this, which is about a like boy band, which is like really good. It's like about boy band and like fandom culture which I feel like is very like fitting for this fandom podcast that we're doing. So <laughs> that one, so that one um, is being published in the U S later this year. I think actually in October, it's supposed to be published yeah, here in the U S that's not here yet. It's you not here yet, British but if you ILL, but if you put an ILL request in, you can get it from, from elsewhere. That's how 85. I read it. Oh, ooh. yes, yes. That's how <laughs> I did it. I got a copy of it and it was, and it was fantastic. She also, and then she's written two other Heartstopper novellas. She wrote Nick and Charlie, which talks, which tells Nick and Charlie's story from like a little bit later than the Heartstopper series. It's like around the time that like Nick's like in year 13, which is like senior year here in America. And then... Also, this winter, which they touch on a little bit in book four, it's about like the Christmas around the time that Charlie is having his like mental issues. So those are two like really short novellas that are also Nick and Charlie was just announced to be pro- that being published in the U.S. I think in January maybe, but that also you could put in a request to get that from another library. Other libraries have purchased the British volume of that. I think I think that's it. I don't I don't think she has any others off the top of my head. I think those are those are it. So lots lots of different things, and we own most of them. Whatever we don't own, you can get through in our library loan. Go to our website. You can find out more information about mm-hmm. that. Been in such a hard stopper kind of mode that I actually just put solitaire on hold. Yay! And I am okay. so excited to read it and keep kind of exploring this the Heartstopper universe. Solitaire is a very interesting book. It's interesting because that was like her very first one. So like, you know, it's definitely like a different kind of style than Heartstopper. Like I feel like Solitaire is very, so it's very dark. It's very like angsty, whereas Heartstopper is like very like fluffy and light yeah. for the most part. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that just comes from, like I said, that was her first book. So she's definitely evolved since then. It's just very interesting how different is, but it's a very interesting story so like by all means like you know especially as heartstopper lovers as we all are like it's nice to see like the origin like where they come from and tori is such an interesting character as well oh, tori. and, and uh, <laughs> everyone loves tori tori is tori is so so great we love a sarcastic sassy like what wednesday adams, adams type of nowhere person. always <laughs> always appears out of nowhere like just Older sister magic older sister magic so <laughs> so solitary definitely like you know if anyone really like wants to kind of like see where heartstopper st- started like where this whole like Ozman universe like kind of started like that is definitely an excellent an excellent book to check out so that about does it for our discussion here does anyone yay. have any kind of like final thoughts before we close out for today yay yay excellent heartstopper we love you we love you, Heartstopper. And like we said before, but Alice Oseman, we love you. Thank you for creating Thank this you, world. Thank, Thank you, you for making world. Thank you for making people of all ages seen and validated. <laughs> and we are just eternally grateful. We're grateful for you, grateful for the series. 
cheers right. to volume five and season three cheers yeah. to yeah. season two we have, we haven't even gotten to season two yet so i'm cheers already to, looking ahead <laughs> i know cheers to season two and three and to volume five which sadly will be the last volume but you know that's 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 all right we got five volumes out of it uh, you know it's so wonderful and there's still time it's not it's far from over <laughs> so okay well thank you so much for joining us today be sure to check out our website the ocean county library.org slash teens slash fan nation for all events happening this year in person and virtually all titles mentioned in today's episodes can be accessed free with your library cards until next time have a fantastic day